All righty. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the How to Get Started with Wolf SSL webinar presented by Chris Conlin, an engineer here at Wolf SSL. My name is Kajal, and I will be moderating this webinar. All attendees will be in listen only mode. There will, however, be a Q&A session at the end of the pre presentation in which uh, we'll answer any questions that are typed into the Q&A box, or you can also raise your hand and answer the question live if you'd like. This webinar will be recorded and made available via a link following the presentation. And now, without further ado, I present Chris. Thanks, Kajal. And hello, everyone. Um, thanks for attending this webinar today. This is going to be on how to get started with Wolf SSL. Uh, like Kajal introduced myself, I'm Chris Conlon, an engineering manager at Wolf SSL. Uh, and today, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to share a little bit about Wolf SSL, especially some introductory type material. Um, walk through a kind of a quick introduction to Wolf SSL and, and a quick overview of the SSL and TLS protocol. We'll go through some details about Wolf SSL, our SSL and TLS library, an overview how you can build it on common systems. Um, our WolfGrip test and benchmark applications, some basic library usage, and some debugging tips. And then after that point, um, I'm hoping to do a, a quick live demo to show you guys the WolfGrip test and benchmark applications running, and then we'll open it up for uh, any questions you may have. So let's start with a quick introduction to Wolf SSL. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, you know, we essentially secure the internet by securing data. Uh, SSL and TLS and cryptography is pretty horizontal technology, so we end up going into lots of different vertical markets. Uh, some examples of those are listed on this slide here. Wolf SSL itself started in 2004 out of the MySQL database company. At that time, they needed a clean room SSL implementation. Um, our co-founders sat down and essentially wrote our first library called Yazl in C++. Yazl, Yazl stood for yet another SSL. Between 2004 and 2006, the market, especially the embedded market, really demanded a C-based library instead of C++. And so we sat down, rewrote the library again, this time in C, and called that c Yazl, which was yet another SSL written in C. In 2014, we changed the name to Wolf SSL, uh, mainly to be more consistent across product naming, to be easier to understand, easier to say, especially in different parts of the world. We have over a thousand commercial customers that use Wolf SSL and 17 partners that resell us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have over 2 billion active connections is our estimate of what we secure at any one time on the internet. And our company has been growing ever since I started with the company in 2010. Uh, we were three people back then, now we're over 30 now in 2020. This slide shows our current product lineup. Our main product is Wolf SSL, uh, SSL and TLS library. Underneath that sits WolfCrypt, our cryptography library. We do have a couple of validated versions of that for FIPS 140-2 and for DO 178. We have an asynchronous crypto module um, if you're on the server side and using accelerator cards like at Intel QuickSyst or Cavium Nitrox. We have an MQTT client library, a Wolf SSH implementation, um, a TPM 2.0 library, and our newest product this last year is a secure bootloader called Wolf Boot. Uh, all those products in the first row are written in C. Um, the second row is a set of language wrappers. We do have users that want to use us from other languages. Um, for example, Java, we have a JSSE and JCE provider, as well as just a thin JNI wrapper. Uh, we have a C Sharp wrapper, a Python wrapper, and a JavaScript wrapper. And then the third row here is a set of applications uh, that we have available. We have an SSL proxy. Uh, we have a simple certificate enrollment protocol implementation, a secure update solution, a command line utility. Uh, we provide commercial support for curl. And we have a version of curl that's um, meant for resource constrained devices called tiny curl. All these products are dual licensed under both GPL v2 and a commercial license. And one of the things we like to really focus on, you know, implementing 
cryptography and security software is making sure we're doing a lot of great testing. Uh, we have a goal of being the best tested SSL, TLS, and crypto uh, implementations available today. And we're always adding new tests to, to our set of tests that we currently run. Um, we usually roll these all up into a, a continuous integration cycle that runs on per, a pull, per, per pull request basis on GitHub or a nightly test cycle for more extended testing. And we do everything from API unit tests, uh, testing our cipher suites and algorithms, uh, doing benchmark testing to make sure we haven't slowed things down, static analysis with tools like Coverity, ScanBuild, and Facebook's Infer. We do memory testing with Valgrind and Clang's F sanitized address, interop testing against uh, other popular SSL TLS implementations, um, real world builds where we're testing our customers' builds, so we make sure we don't break those uh, as we do future development. Uh, testing against many different compilers, doing peer review and third party testing, uh, several different fuzz testing using our own custom fuzzers as well as AFL, TLS fuzzer, libfuzzer, and OSS fuzz. And so, kind of in short, you know, why would you want to use Wolf SSL products? Um, we try to build things for portability, modularity, and performance. So we're, WolfSSL itself is 20 times smaller than OpenSSL, which of course is a benefit on research and strain or embedded devices. Um, our strong dedication to testing, as you saw in this last slide, um, just makes, makes you, our customers more confident. There's, there's fewer vulnerabilities and fewer bugs uh, making it into our end releases. We're mature and widely used, uh, securing over 2 billion active connections. We do have a strong commitment to security and, and adding new secure features and our code bases are well supported. We have all the original core developers still on the team that wrote the, the code. Uh, so that lets us add, add features more quickly and fix bugs more efficiently. So now we'll move on to kind of a quick overview of SSL and TLS for those of you who aren't as familiar with it. So TLS has three main goals, um, authentication, confidentiality, and integrity. Um, authentication being the first of those is authenticating the client and or the server side of the connection. The server is commonly authenticated by default where the client authentication is optional. Uh, this is done using asymmetric crypto with RSA or ECC and or a pre-shared key setup uh, acronymed as PSK. The second main goal is confidentiality. So this guarantees data is only visible to our endpoints. And the third goal is integrity, um, meaning data can't be modified by an attacker in transit. Where does SSL and TLS sit? Uh, this is a simplified um, version of the OSI model diagram, and an SSL itself sits between the transport and application layers. Here you can see the SSL sub protocols in blue uh, sitting on top of, in this case, TCPIP. And then just some example application uh, layer protocols listed here in green. When a client first connects to a server, uh, it goes through the TLS handshake process. So this, you can see a simplified diagram of it on this slide. Um, there are several round trips that happen here and you finally end up at the bottom with a secure communication channel. During this process, uh, certificates are exchanged, authentication is done to the client and or server, um, and the common keying material is set up to use for that secure connection. TLS uses what's called a cipher suite. Uh, this is a kind of the, the format of that string representation displayed on this slide. It starts with a protocol uh, followed by a key exchange, a bulk encryption algorithm in an optional mode, and then lastly, a message authentication function. If you've ever configured TLS or used SSL and TLS before, you've probably seen strings similar to these. These are some examples of, of TLS 1.2 cipher suites. Um, SSL and TLS itself has had several versions. It was invented by 1995 um, by Netscape, with SSL 2.0 being the first version released to the public. SSL uh, 2.0 and 3.0 are now considered insecure. In 1999, um, TLS came out. The protocol had gone through enough changes that the it warranted a name change. So TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. Um, TLS has had four revisions, 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. 
And then paralleling TLS development has been DTLS, which stands for Datagram TLS. Um, this is designed to be run over unreliable protocols, such as UDP. One example of an application type that might be using DTLS would be uh, a VoIP type application. So if you look back in, in the TLS protocol, there's been a lot of vulnerabilities discovered at the protocol level. Um, the researchers, as, as you probably have noticed, like to give them catchy acronym names. Um, and the TLS 1.3 protocol designers wanted to help kind of solve this problem and make it harder for vulnerabilities to be discovered in the future. So TLS 1.3, um, it was in development for over five years. It started in August of 2013 and was finalized in August of 2018. It, was, it had 28 drafts in between those times and was finally given uh, the RFC number of 8446. There were a lot of different changes in TLS 1.3. Um, these are the highlights. There were algorithm changes. Um, they removed insecure features. Most of the handshake messages are different and more of them are encrypted. There's a new zero RTT or zero round trip time mode. Uh, redesign key derivation functions and also changes to how session resumption is being done. So what are the you know, main advantages to TLS 1.3 for the end user? The first of those is faster performance. TLS 1.2 and before required two complete round trips uh, to establish the, a secure connection. TLS 1.3 only requires one complete round trip. And so that one less round trip means network latency has less of an impact on that time to establish a secure connection. And then optionally, there's this new zero RTT mode, which means data, application data can be sent in the first flight um, along with that first client hello sent across. The second main advantage is that it's more secure. So the protocol designers removed all the legacy and insecure algorithms. So this makes it harder for people to use insecure things accidentally. So RSA key transport was removed, RC4 stream ciphers, uh, CVC mode ciphers, the SHA-1 hash function, arbitrary Diffie-Hellman groups, and also export ciphers. And then also, it, this can be more flexible for some use cases. It does allow a new key update um, functionality. So if, if you have an existing TLS connection you need to, to update the keying material on, there's a special key update message that can be sent any time after the handshake. Um, previous versions of TLS used, they did the, the authentication of the client and or the server during the handshake. TLS 1.3 allows post handshake authentication. That can be done anytime after the handshake is completed. And then also the removal of, of some of those old and insecure features can also help reduce the library footprint size, uh, which is a benefit for our, our resource constrained users. So that's kind of the quick overview of, of the protocol and, and especially TLS 1.3. If you'd like to learn more, we do have a TLS 1.3 specific page on our website. Okay, so let's dive into WolfSSL itself. Um, WolfSSL at a high level is written in C. It's very lightweight and portable. It supports up to the current uh, protocol standards of TLS 1.3 and DTLS 1.2. As a footprint size of 2200 kilobytes and runtime memory usage of 1 to 36 kilobytes per session. Um, we've ported it to almost every operating system in our task that we've encountered today. And you can see our a pretty long list at the bottom of this slide here. Oh, WolfSSL supports an OpenSSL compatibility layer. This makes it easier to port WolfSSL into applications that had been using OpenSSL in the past. It's a, a shim layer that includes probably about a thousand of the most commonly used OpenSSL functions. And we map those down to our, our native WolfSSL APIs internally. And so oftentimes it can simply be a kind of a drop-in replacement. We ported WolfSSL into several different web server implementations, including Nginx, Apache, Lighty, and Mongoose. WolfSSL has um, pretty good support for hardware cryptography. So if you have this available in your silicon, we can offload down to it for performance improvements and code size reductions. We typically see about a, somewhere between a five and 10 times performance increase using hardware crypto over software crypto. 
And then Wolfsl is NSA Suite B compatible and also validated to FIPS 140 2 level one. WolfCrypt is the cryptography library that supports WolfSSL underneath. Um, this supports all of the, the common algorithms that you'd see today, in addition to some of the more progressive ones like Cha Cha 20, Poly 1305, and Curve and Add 25519. All these algorithms can be used individually, and it's been designed to be fairly modular, so you can pull out specific algorithms if you only need to use a subset of those. You can download WolfSSL either from our website directly um, or from GitHub if you'd like to track our development progress. So once you download WolfSSL, let's take a walk through kind of the package structure of what you might find inside there. I know, you know sometimes it can be a little overwhelming downloading it and trying to figure out what, what all these different directories and files are. So here's a, a package structure that I have. I downloaded WolfSSL 4.4.0, which is our most recent release. Uh, the first directory, which is named IDE. So this is where you'll want to look if, if you want to open WolfSSL up in an IDE or compiler and essentially have a, a project ready to just hit build and compile. And so we have a support for a bunch of different IDEs and environments in here. Um, everything from Arduino IDEs to IAR eWARM, ARMS, MBK Kyle, Rally Crossworks, Renesas, eSquared Studio, um, and much more. The certs directory, this is where we keep uh, example certificates and keys. So we have client and server certs and keys, CA certs, um, RSA 1024-2048, bit um, keys, as well as, well as ECC. We have example certificate revocation lists and Diffie element parameters files. And we use these in our own examples. We use them in testing. And they can be helpful to get you kind of up and running more quickly in a test environment. Uh, for those of you building on Unix Linux, WolfSSL uses the autoconf system. Um, there's a configure script, which will handle configuring the library. Uh, the C Taucrypt and C Yazl directories, this is a C Yazl compatibility layer. Um, we switched the name in 2014 from C Yazl to WolfSSL, and we maintain this compatibility layer for essentially backwards compatibility for those people who had been using the C Yazl API naming scheme. We have an examples directory. This includes an example client server, echo client and echo server. Um, these can be helpful for testing. They also are a good place to look for usage examples of our API. And then we do have additional examples, um, a bunch of more simple ones in a separate GitHub repository called WolfSSL-examples. Uh, GenCertBuff.pl, this is a Perl script. Um, it's used to generate a C array from a certificate or key file. And so we do have users that are on platforms with no file system. And this is just an easy way to convert a file into a C array. Down towards the bottom, there's a WolfCrypt directory. This is the source directory for all the crypto layer files. The WolfSSL subdirectory, this is the header and include directory for WolfSSL and WolfCrypt. Uh, WolfSSL, it, the subdirectory itself holds the WolfSSL layer headers. The WolfSSL slash WolfCrypt subdirectory holds the WolfCrypt layer headers. And then WolfSSL slash OpenSSL is where we keep our OpenSSL compatibility layer headers. Uh, for those of you building with Visual Studio, um, you'll find several Visual Studio solution files near the bottom of the package. And then the last directory is called wrapper. This is holding a C-sharp wrapper for WolfSSL. Um, note that we do have other language wrappers, but they're a little bit larger and we, we tend to package them separately because of that. Okay, so now you know what's in the WolfSSL package. Uh, the next thing to talk about is how do you go about building that? So I mentioned WolfSSL uses autoconf by default for Unix and Linux platforms, uh, which means it, you know, building WolfSSL is as simple as uh, entering the directory, running configure to configure the library, running make to compile it, and then installing it with make install or sudo make install. Um, configure 
has a help option, dash dash help. If you run this, you'll see all of our available, enable and disable configure options. Um, this is where you can customize features, enable and disable algorithms, TLS extensions, and all kinds of stuff. Um, once you have chosen some options you want to enable or disable, um, you would just append those to your configure line. In this case, is an example of enabling ECC and enabling DTLS. And if you need to pass preprocessor defines um, through the configure script, you can do that using the C flags variable. Here you can see we're just defining a define called example underscore define. Um, after you've configured the library, if you run make check, this will run our own internal uh, test suite and API tests. And then once you've configured and compiled the library, you can install it using make install or sudo make install. Uh, it's in, installed by default to user local, which would be user local include wolfSSL is where your headers would be, and user local lib is where your library files would be installed. For those of you building on Windows, um, you can compile using Visual Studio using some of the Visual Studio solution files that we distribute with the library. We have a couple different versions of those, one for compiling WolfSSL with Entrue, which is a post-quantum crypto algorithm. Um, we have one solution that compiles a 32-bit library and one that compiles a 64-bit library. And those solution files include projects for our example client server, example echo client and server, um, an SSL sniffer, a test suite, and also the Wolf SSL library itself. And we have more detailed instructions and in walking through building on Visual Studio on our website if, for those of you interested in, in learning just a little bit more here. Uh, some Windows users like to compile this with Sigwin. Um, this kind of brings the Unix Linux type uh, familiarity to Windows. So if you're using Sigwin, uh, some of the required Sigwin packages are automake, autoconf, libtool, make, and unzip. And then after you have that set up, you would essentially just follow the autoconf instructions that we went through previously. If you're compiling WolfSSL on an, another platform, um, there, there's an install file in the root directory, which is helpful for uh, at least, you know, being pointed in the right direction towards how you should compile for that platform. Um, and we have, you know, several of our other supported platforms listed in there. And then I think lastly, for, for users that want to compile WolfSSL into their own project, um, integrated into a pre-existing IDE project, for example, um, you'll essentially just want to move in the, the source files and the header files into your project structure. You'll want the SSL and TLS level source files from the uh, source subdirectory the SSL and TLS header files from the Wolf SSL subdirectory, the crypto level source files from Wolf group slash source, and then the crypto header files from Wolf SSL slash Wolf groups um, and dot H inside of there. Uh, like I mentioned, we've designed Wolf SSL with portability in mind. We've tried to abstract out all of the kind of the functionality that would be platform dependent, such as IO or logging, um, memory, uh, standard C library or file systems, writing things along those lines. Um, you can find our existing port layers. So these are ports we've already done in the wolfssl slash wolfcrypt slash settings.h file. In there, you'll see a define, you know, maybe like iPhone or free RTAS, where you could just define that define and all of a sudden, you know, the port layer for that OS or RTAS will be enabled. And uh, most of our users want to configure WolfSSL some way. Um, those users who are not using the autoconf configure system, we recommend that you define WolfSSL underscore user underscore settings. Um, when this is defined, WolfSSL will include by default a file called user underscore settings dot h. And this is where we recommend you put all of your custom preprocessor defines. And it will essentially let you only have to maintain one file as you migrate from release to release of Wolf SSL. And if you want a good example of a user settings.h that's kind of been pre-populated with a lot of the available preprocessor options, um, I recommend you look in the IDE slash rally crossworks arm directory. There's a, a good user setting that's in there that will provide a, a good example for you. 
Okay, so next up, let's look at the test and benchmark applications that um, we ship for WolfCrypt. Uh, first of all, Wolf itself ships with the WolfCrypt test application. Um, this tests all of WolfCrypt's algorithms and makes sure they're working correctly. So it's located in the WolfCrypt slash test directory, a file called test.c. And we recommend this is the kind of the first place you start when getting WolfSSL running on a new platform. Um, you want to make sure the crypto is working first um, before you move on to SSL and TLS. If your crypto is not working, the, the, the TLS layer most likely won't work either. Um, so this runs through a bunch of different test vectors for all enabled algorithms by default. This is compiled by default when you run a make in the, in the WolfSSL root directory. Um, the executable is called test wolfcrypt, and it can be executed from the root directory by running wolfcrypt slash test slash test wolfcrypt. Uh, output, you should see something similar to this, um, essentially an algorithm with either test passed or test failed next to it. If the test fails, you'll also get an error code that can help in debugging. And then we also ship a WolfCrypt benchmark application. So under WolfCrypt slash benchmark, there's a benchmark.c file. And this lets you benchmark WolfCrypt's crypto algorithms on your own hardware. This can be helpful for you know, doing performance comparisons to make sure you're seeing what performance you should be seeing. Um, we have some reference numbers that we post on, on the webpage listed here for several different platforms that we've run this on. This can also be helpful for comparing software versus hardware crypto and seeing what kind of performance difference um, you'll get by offloading into hardware crypto. So this is also compiled by default when running make. The executable is called benchmark, and it can be executed in, from the root directory by just running wolfcrypt slash benchmark slash benchmark. Output will be something similar to this. Um, you see that we benchmark each algorithm for at least one second. You'll see the megabytes per second in throughput and also cycles per byte. The, if we look a little about the structure of the test.c and benchmark.c files, they do include a main, uh, I apologize, it looks like my presentation restarted. One second here, just browsing back to where we were at. So they do include a, a main function by default, um, and they use certificate and key files by default. It, it kind of assumes you're running on a desktop-like system, um, and also benchmarks all enabled algorithms by default. Now we know that a lot of those you know, kind of default settings won't work, especially on an embedded target. And so you can define main, no main driver if you would like to not compile in the main function. Um, you know, most embedded targets, you already have a main driver uh, function working. And so when no main driver is defined, it'll just expose a function that you can call to kind of start uh, the tests or the benchmarks. Um, you can also switch the test and benchmark applications from using files to using C arrays. So if you don't have a file system or you don't want to you know, have to worry about moving those certain key files onto your target, you can define one of several defines. Uh, for example, use cert buffers 1024. will enable RSA to 1024 bit um, C arrays in place of those files. We also have a 2048 bit equivalent and a, the underscore 256 is for enabling uh, ECC keys and certificates. Um, if you're on an embedded target, you can define bench embedded. This will reduce uh, resource use of these applications. And then if you have no main driver uh, defined, you can call either WolfCrypt test or WolfCrypt ben or benchmark test the functions to run either the WolfCrypt test or the benchmarks. Um, you can also either test or benchmark individual algorithms. Each algorithm has its own separate function that can be called. Okay, so let's move on now to you know kind of basic usage of Wolf SSL um, from your application. So the first thing we didn't need to note, uh, you need to make sure your application is compiled with the same preprocessor defines as the Wolf SSL library itself. If you're using AutoConf, it automatically generates an options.h header, 
this makes it easy. You can just include in your application wolfsl slash options.h and your application will automatically pick up all those, you know, preprocessor defines that have been defined in that header. The main header file for SSL and TLS functionality is SSL.h. So in your application, you would include wolfsl slash SSL.h. WolfSSL has two main structures. Uh, WolfSSL structure which represents an SSL and TLS session and a WolfSSL CTX structure which represents a SSL and TLS context. Uh, so first of all, you'll want to initialize the library with WolfSSL and NIT. If you have debug support enabled in the library, either by defining debug underscore WolfSSL or the enable debug option, you can call WolfSSL debugging on to turn on debug logging. Um, you'll want to create a WolfSSL context structure using WolfSSL CTX new. That accepts a protocol version and side method. So here you can see we're creating a context with TLS 1.2 on the client side. And then you'll also want to set or enable uh, peer verification. So ser server authentication is enabled by default client authentication is disabled by default, but using the WolfSSL CTX set verify function, um, you can control uh, how verification is turned on. So here we're enabling it using SSL verify peer, and we're also registering an optional verify callback called my verify. This callback will be called when verification fails. It just allows an application to do, usually do more analysis of a, a verification failure or override some of that and do their own verification logic. Um, you'll want to load in a, a, a trusted root CA certificate or a set of them. Um, you can do that through a dir pem formatted buffer using the wolf SSL CTX load verify buffer function. Here we're loading it from a, an array called CA cert dir 2048, uh, giving it the size of that array. And then we're essentially telling WolfSSL it's a dir formatted uh, array by using SSL file type ASN1. You can also load um, CA certificates from files using the CTX load verify locations function. So then your application would go on, it would make a socket, it would connect that socket. Once the socket's connected, you would make a SSL session for that connection using WolfSSL new. Uh, after that, you'll pass your established socket file descriptor to WolfSSL using WolfSSL set FD. And then your application is ready to uh, essentially connect, you know, establish the secure connection and do the SSL and TLS handshake. So on the client side, you'll call WolfSSL connect, or on the server side, WolfSSL accept. When these function ret functions return successfully, the, your endpoints will have completed the TLS handshake and they'll be ready for secure communication. Um, you can write data using the WolfSSL write function and read data using WolfSSL read. When you're all finished, you can shut down the session using WolfSSL shutdown. And then finally free up your resources with WolfSSL free, WolfSSL context free, and WolfSSL cleanup. If you'd like more details kind of of the API and, and usage information, um, Please look at chapter 17 of the WolfSSL manual. This is the WolfSSL API reference. And also, I mentioned WolfSSL ships with an example client. This can be a really good place to look as a, for an example of API usage as well. Now, WolfCrypt can be used also from applications directly. Um, the WolfCrypt API is exposed to the WolfSSL slash WolfCrypt um, headers. Here is an example of you know, adding AES to uh, an application, including WolfSSL WolfScript AES.h. And then each of our algorithms has a structure associated with it. Here you can see AES has an AES structure. And for WolfScript API usage, um, please see chapter 18 of the WolfSSL manual. This is the WolfScript API reference. A couple notes about thread safety. Uh, WolfSSL is thread safe by design, meaning multiple threads can enter the library simultaneously. Um, WolfSSL avoids global data, stati static data, and, and sharing objects. There are a couple exceptions to this that you need to, to pay attention to in your application if you're running WolfSSL in a multi-threaded environment. 
the first uh, of these exceptions is um, an application can share access to one Wolf SSL object across threads, but the access to that object must be synchronized and protected. Uh, for example, you know, trying to do two reads and writes at the same time from two different threads to the same Wolf SSL object is not supported. And the second exception is that as an application, you must completely initialize the context structure before passing that structure to Wolf SSL new. Um, the reason being when you create a, a session from a context, um, it reads you know, all of the data from that context at the time you call it Wolf SSL new. And so any future updates you make to the context will not be reflected in the, the Wolf SSL session object itself. And so we recommend that you, know, you have a, a single thread initialize the Wolf SSL context structure to avoid synchronization problems. Okay, so now that you've got Wolf SSL kind of up and running, installed, you know, in the most simple case, I just kind of wanted to give you a couple of tips on debugging Wolf SSL. Um, it is common for, you know, connection problems to come up, especially when you're first getting uh, a client end or server connecting. So the first tip, debug logging can be uh, extremely helpful for seeing more details of, of what's going on in the connection. Um, you can enable that with the enable debug configure option or by defining um, Wolf SSL debug. In an application, then after calling Wolf SSL init, um, you'll want to enable debug logging by calling Wolf SSL debugging on. There is a corresponding function called debugging off if you want to switch logging back off at some point. And what does the debug log show? Well, we have uh, messages that show you entering and that when we're entering and leaving many functions. Um, it lets you see details of the handshake process, details of the certificate parsing and validation process. And it really just gives you much more context around a specific error. And then I also recommend you try to leverage the example Wolf SSL client and server um, when possible, especially when you're just getting going. Um, it can provide a kind of a working, known stable endpoint for you to test against. So if you're developing a client, maybe consider testing against the Wolf SSL example server. Or if you're developing a server, consider uh, you know, testing with the Wolf SSL, Wolf SSL example client. And then Wireshark can be extremely helpful. Um, our support team will most likely ask you for a Wireshark trace if you get in contact with us. It lets you, you know, inspect the, the packets of the handshake message, um, drill down in and, and look at the details of the protocols and the cipher suites and um, a bunch of different stuff. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna to try to give you a quick live demo of the WolfCrypt uh, test and benchmark applications. I'm going to switch my screen share over to a terminal window here. Wow, I apologize. It looks like uh, my presentation device here is running out of disk space. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't be able to uh, do the demo at this point, but um, it was reflected pretty clearly in some of our slides, um, how you would run the Wolf Group test and benchmark applications. It's just kind of a fun thing to look at, um, especially when you've got hardware crypto that you can easily switch on and see the performance uh, numbers go up substantially. Okay, so I guess with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, let's see, it looks like we might have a few that have already come in through the Q&A. Yeah, um, what is the max size of Wolf SSL considering TLS 1.3 and 1.2? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we know a lot of people are, most people are concerned with footprint sizes. Um, in general, our, you know, on an embedded optimized compiler, you'll typically see Wolf SSL sizes in the range of 100 kilobytes, maybe 60 to 100 kilobytes. Um, the smallest build we've done to date is 21 kilobytes. That was a very 
pared down version that only supported pre-shared keys um, and, and TLS 1.2 at that time? Um, what is the total stack size used by Wolf SSL? Is there a provision to make whole a whole library use stack memory only? If yes, then will it still need a few memory from the heap for uh, creating context? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, for the, in general, the total stack size, I don't have a good number off the top of my head. We do have a couple build options though. We do have a, a small stack build option, which almost does probably the reverse of what uh, it sounds like you're asking here, where it, it tries to maintain 1K of stack usage only and put everything else on the heap. But then in contrast to that, we have a build option that's a Wolf SSL static memory only build. And in that case, we don't use any dynamic memory and we'll just use uh, static memory. Is there a provision fetch and load certifications or load certs and keys from a physical address? If yes, how can this be done? So right now loading certs and keys, they're treated typically as an external input, meaning we, we only have APIs to load them through files or through a, a, a memory array. Um, there are a couple of cases we've integrated down into a secure storage um, you know, on modules like a, a microchip, ATEC, where keys are generated and, and stored in hardware um, or in a TPM type device. Can WolfCrypt be built separately and placed in one part of memory, say SRAM and WolfSSL library in another part of memory, say DRAM? Will this work seamlessly? Uh, right now, I, I don't believe that would be an out of the box, you know, easy thing to do. We do have a way to configure the library to build only WolfCrypt, um, but we're only building, you know, one library as an artifact at this point, libwolfssl. Uh, user has support for 10.24. 2048 and 256, how to load 4096 key? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I just listed those sizes as references in the slides. Um, we will support pretty much any size RSA or ECC key. Um, I guess the ECC key is given that we support the curve it's on. Um, there are there's one define you need to adjust in the math library if your RSA keys are bigger than kind of our default. And for that, you'll want to search for FP underscore max underscore bits in our documentation. Is there any macro to debug stack and heap usage? Um, we, I, we, I don't believe we have one for debugging stack usage. We do have a, what we call kind of a memory tracker for, for heap um, debugging, which overrides um, the memory handlers with custom memory handlers so we can keep track of some extra information. Um, but if you're searching for that in the docs, I, I think you'll want to look for memory tracker. Is Wolf SSL compatible with Wolf SSH? Do they both utilize Wolf Crypt and the same uh, math libraries? Yeah, so Wolf SSL and Wolf SSH, as from a protocol standpoint, they're different protocols. Um, SSH won't use TLS internally, but they do both use WolfCrypt uh, for the cryptography backend. Is there some example to use Wolf SSH in combination with C++? Gosh, that's a good question. I don't think we have that example readily available. We just have, you know, examples using it from C right now. Um, will, there all, what, will there also be a Wolf MQTT introduction? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I, I know if we haven't already done a webinar in, on Wolf MQTT, that's definitely something that also will be coming up. If you, 
uh, go onto our YouTube page, all of our past webinars that we've done will be on the YouTube page. And I think we've done a Wolf MQTT webinar where we talk about uh, recent updates we've made to Wolf MQTT. What is the effect of energy consumption of a device if I use Wolf SSL? Okay, sure. That, that's a good question, too. Um, I don't think it's an extremely straightforward one to answer. It may depend on what algorithm you're using. Some algorithms are, you know, designed to use less memory and be more, more uh, I mean, not memory, uh, energy, and be more energy efficient than others. Um, I would recommend maybe getting in contact with our support team, and they can point you towards some of those algorithms. Does Wolf SSL support both a DER and PEM formatted certificates? We do. Wolf SSL does support either DER or PEM uh, formatted certificates, um, either through files or through buffers. And we also support um, PKCS 8 and PKCS 12. What is the most energy efficient algorithm? I. I don't think I can answer that right now. Um, I, if you get in contact with our support team, we can maybe give you some recommendations or point you in the right direction. All righty, and that was all of the questions. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. If you have any more questions, please contact us at support at wolfssl.com or facts at wolfssl.com and we'd love to get back to you. Uh, this is a reminder to everyone to please follow us on all of our socials. We are w at Wolf SSL on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And this is also a reminder that everyone will be emailed a video link to the presentation. And we will also upload this to YouTube for future viewings. Thank you so much for attending and have a great day.